Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are having the Industry 4.0 community live actually every week, Tuesdays at noon central. Make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you guys get notified every week when we go live. Today, we have the first 15 minutes. We have a member from our community, John Sindretz, and we're going to be talking about his uh, journey through the mentorship program and also his experience in the quality industry with ISO 9001. As always, we have Walker Reynolds uh, back. You know, last week he was out. He's back this week, and he's going to be answering your questions. We've got a couple of really good questions lined up for you guys. Uh, monitoring the chat, we have Vaughn Turner. And also, uh, we do have a sponsor, which I am actually really excited to share uh, with you guys today. So every week, we're going to have a sponsor segment at the beginning of the show. And this oh, week- Oh, Zach, sponsor oh, Zach sponsored. you sponsored the show? Yes. You sponsored I want the you show? Guys, awesome. <laughs> the Digital Factory Mastermind Program. The first link in the description, you guys want to click that. And uh, I'm letting you guys know about our program. It's not just an online course. Well, it is an online course, but it's also a monthly mastermind. And we're actually meeting this Friday. So that's why uh, we wanted to hop on here and let you guys know that by joining today, you'll get access to the Digital Factory Mastermind program. Step one, building a unified namespace. Step two, ERP secrets revealed. And we're kind of making our way this year. We're going to be building out this program uh, on Friday, we're going to be learning getting data in and out of the unified namespace, historical data. That's a really common question, and it's crucial to get right in order to scale your machine learning and AI applications. And really what we wanted to let you know is the Digital Factory Mastermind program is your tool to architect, sell, and implement digital transformation. And if you go to that first link in the description, you can meet a mastermind member, Dave Schultz. You can listen to a testimonial from him. And also, if you haven't already, watch the one-hour free mastermind training. It's worth every second. Click that first link in the description. Watch that free mastermind training, and we'll see you guys this Friday. So that's, that's it for this uh, sponsor. I do also want you guys to join the Industry 4.0 community Discord server. It's free to join, and it really helps connect the community. We are almost at 1,000 members. We are 975 members. So click. It's further down in the links, uh, but there is a link to join the community Discord server, so you'll want to do that. And without any further ado, thank you for joining, and we'll uh, kick it off to Walker Reynolds and John Sindrich. All right, so all right, so I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, ba -ba -da, ba -ba -da. All right, um, so I want to shout out to Dan Riken real quick. The rule of Borg still applies. What any nodes know, all nodes know. Thank you, Daniel, sir. Um, so this week we're going to start with, so I was obviously, let me real quick. So last week I had a, an emergency pop up on Tuesday, a personal emergency that I had to deal with. It doesn't happen very often. Um, what I, uh, but I was actually completely unplugged for like six days. I didn't get caught back up until yesterday at all. Um, and one of the things that I learned through that process is, um, you know, this is just a life lesson. <clears throat> that was totally unplanned, totally not, did not expect that to happen. Um, these things happen in our lives. And, um, you know, they call it unplanned for a reason. Incredibly important to have a team to lean on during those times, whether that team is a personal team, your family at home, or whether that team is your work team, or whether that's your community team, right? This community that we've built through, uh, you know, our our collective love and ideas of in all things industry 4.0 and digital transformation. So, um, the the team did a phenomenal job. Uh, I would have let a lot people a lot of people down had I not had a team to 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 lean on. So uh, the lesson here, you know, that I just want to drive home is. Um, you know, Murphy's law says that anything on anything that can happen will happen. And that is true. So, um, you know, you can't do everything on your own and it's important to have a solid team. So I just want to say thank you. So with that, uh, we're doing this new community spotlight, um, segment, which is basically like the first 15 minutes we're highlighting somebody who's a member of the community. John Sindrich is one of, you know, he's John and I've had many, many conversations together. He, you know, we brought him in actually into, meetings with clients and discussing projects and stuff because he's, you know, because of his quality background. And, um, and this week we're going to spotlight John. So John, do you want to real quick, just talk a little bit about, you know, who you are, what's your background, how we met, um, you know, and, and what, 
what brought you to our community? Like, why are you yeah. a member of our community? Walker, uh, do you want to stop sharing so we can see gallery mode? Yes. There we go. Well go. played, Zach. Very good, Zach. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on here. Um, yeah, basically, you know, my background is not in uh, the automation field at all. It's really, it's always been quality. Um, early on in my early 20s, um, you know, I got started with the ISO 9001. Um, I've always been in manufacturing, uh, rubber and plastics, uh, electronics, uh, a little bit automotive. So it's always been manufacturing and it's always been in quality and operations roles. Um, I was really searching for uh, kind of a platform to uh, create a quality system dashboard. So I was searching around for that. And another problem I was having from a quality perspective is always getting data to do continuous improvement projects or root cause analysis. Um, no matter where I was, either either the data is not being collected or if it is collected, it's in a vault someplace and ERP or IT has got it and I got to beg to get anything out of it. So I didn't like that. I've never liked that. Um, but I was searching, I was trying to create some kind of dashboard where I could either get process data or measure KPIs and also help with ISO 9001 implementations. Mm -hmm. And so in my search from that, I was, you know, I was doing everything from, you know, PowerPoint with links to um, all the way up to, I started learning Django and React to try to create something, you know, web-based. And the more I did that, I realized, wow, I'm building a website. No one's going to want to maintain that. and I don't want to maintain it. So, um, eventually I ran across ignition and, um, and I ran across, you know, Walker and telec integration as well. And, uh, and I fell in love with the ignition platform and, and also, and I'd always been listening to you guys videos for, you know, like a year, you know, before I talked mm -hmm. to you guys. And, um, so when I got a chance to, when I saw this, this mentorship thing pop up, popped up I just like jumped right on it I was excited to be a part of that and um, you know of course I joined the discord group as well and um, I had a question I think it was one of the conversations um, I think Walker mentioned about a pilot program he did and, and um, I called made an appointment with Walker because I was curious what they did on that pilot to get buy-in actually from from this company and so we talked a little bit and uh, and I mentioned how, you know, this is a platform that really all quality people should love. They should be jumping on this to be able to get their data. And, and Walker told me, well, that's, that's actually not the case. In, in, your, in his projects, he found that the quality function is usually a barrier to these projects. So, um, you know, we got to talking about that. And, and uh, I, I still want to find a way to get around that and actually bring quality functions on board. Um, I'm hoping through this dashboard thing that I'm making and show some value to quality functions. Um, I Hopefully they don't just get buy-in. I hope they're excited about it. You know, I hope that quality people are looking for a platform and they come across this and they're the ones going to the CEO and say, Hey, can we do this? So I, I'd like to go that, get that far with it. So, so John, what do you, um, so right now you work in a quality capacity, you know, you're, you're contracting in quality departments for the most part, right? That's generally right. what you're doing. Yeah. And, I'm a contract quality engineer. And so how do you see long-term the role of the quality engineer changing or evolving um, as a function of industry 4.0, IAOT and digital transformation. Like you're, you've been in the, you've been in the program, you've been part of the community long enough now to sort of see, okay, now I get it. I know where we're going. So you obviously have connected the dots at somehow that, Hey, the role of the quality engineer is going to change. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going right. to evolve. How do you see it evolving? What is fundamentally, what's probably, what's the biggest change that you think that you expect to see? Well, so one of them, I think it's been discussed here and there was really like the root cause analysis, you know, having so much data at your fingertips that you can actually, you know, not only do your own analysis, but, you know, eventually get to where, you know, you have machine learning and, you know, AI or something's telling you, hey, something's amiss here, you know, look into it kind of thing. 
So that's one way. Um, another thing I thought of is, um, you know, take something like customer complaints in a manufacturing environment. Um, you know, if, if I'm making headlights for Ford trucks and, you know, a Ford plant calls me up and says, hey, these housings are cracking. Um, yes, you do root cause analysis, but that's not actually the first step. Your first step is actually some containment activities. So, you know, I want to know, hey, you know, is there 10 more skids on the dock ready to go out in half an hour? Because if so, I need to stop that. And I need to let planning know that I'm stopping it. Um, you know, I need to know if we're still building more of those because you don't want to continue to build scrap. And so that's something where I could see AI helping out. Because right now, when I have to do all those activities, call planning and talk to the supervisor on the line, you know, and issue a quality alert. Um, those things might take two or three hours by the time I get hold of everybody and, and all that. We've had clients where it's taken, we've had clients where it takes up to two weeks to get through that wow. process. It's like, that would be what's known as track and trace. Right. Traceability. Well, he, the first piece is containment, right? Which is right. there, there are parameters for containment, right? The, the idea right. that if we're going to take containment measures, that is, we want to make sure we don't send anything that could potentially be, have quality issues mm. out. There are parameters for that. Um, you Which know, means it you need could, to know where everything's at in real time. Correct. You got to know where it is in real time. Exactly. But right. sorry, John, didn't mean to go ahead. No, that, that's okay. You're right. It could take weeks, you know, before you figure out the true cause again, cause you're not measuring a lot of stuff. So in some cases you're guessing, um, you know, there's things, fishbone exercises, there's five whys, there's different quality tools that you can use to try to narrow it down take your best guess. But, a lot of times you don't know. A lot of or, times you don't did, find out. So here's an example I want to use it related to quality using track and trace. Um, we had a client that, and anybody who's been in mentorship or digital mastermind has actually seen the case study uh, that we that we did. Uh, I didn't. I haven't showed the trace and track and trace piece yet. Um, but you guys have seen the case study on the ROI for an MES system in a digitally in a digital transformation initiative. That's that $25 million over a nine month thing that you guys have all seen. Um, there, there's another piece to that story, okay? And, what, and then the other piece of that story is traceability. So that that customer, you know, produces a product for the automotive industry, um, a subcomponent, they're a tier one automotive supplier and they provide a subcomponent that goes into finished cars. And when they get a quality issue, them, there are something like 60 different sub-assemblies that go into the making that finished good. And they're all serialized and all that jazz. But if they got a quality return for, uh, for one of those units, they would it would take up to two weeks to trace that back manually to what all the sub-assemblies were. So who were the raw material providers? Who were the vendors who provided the sub-assembly? Did we do it ourselves? Did, they, did we have somebody else do it? Through a digital transformation initiative, part of that case study I showed you guys, we cut that from two weeks to 10 seconds. So they can put in the serial number now of any finished good, any finished part that they shipped out, or the serial number of any sub-assembly that was generated, and you can see the, the finished good that it actually went into. And the other thing that they can do is they, they can, and the thing that John here, I think, is getting at is there is a mechanism here for you to predefine the parameters of what would trigger containment. So if I'm gonna do containment, I wanna contain any of the things that are maybe that product code. I don't wanna send any more of those product codes out, or I don't wanna send out any more of those units that have this raw material vendor, or I don't wanna send out any of those units that were using this lot for this sub-assembly. All of that stuff in an industry 3.0 organization is either paper um, or it's completely pencil whipped. That is the quality groups are just absolutely blind and, and can't, don't, can't even connect those dots, right? And, and it, the, uh, the it, it, digital transformation makes containing quality issues so much easier. I mean, just way, way easier. Um, and, and, it, and that's something we'll demonstrate. I haven't even showed any of you guys. We haven't even done that part of the case study. You guys have only seen the impact that MES, OEE and waste tracking had on that customer, but sorry, go ahead, John. Yeah, no, that's totally it. Um, yeah, especially a containment up front. It'd be great if AI could tell me, 
you know, like you said, I put in, you know, the serial number, the product number, and it can tell me, hey, you got some on the dock right now. Do you want those on hold? I can just go, yes. Do you want to let planning know? Yes. Um, do you want to take these pictures I got emailed from the customer and send them down to the, you know, operator on the line where it's running right now so they can be aware of it mm-hmm. immediately? Um, you know, instead of me trying to draw something up and laminate it and walk it down to the floor, you know, that kind of thing. Last, so, uh, last question, John, which is, yeah. you know, being a member of the community, being a member of this industry 4.0 community and all the things that you do, your study group on Saturdays with Dan and all those guys, I think you guys are, you meet every other Saturday and you guys yeah. are all really active in, in the discord server and, you know, come to every, basically every single meeting and all that. Um, what's, what, what, um, if you had to narrow it down to just one thing that you are, you personally, John, as a professional are getting from that, what is it? What is the thing? Is it the camaraderie? Is it the community? I mean, what is the thing that resonates the most? Yeah. So there's two things I'll say, you know, there's one, and then there's a close second. Um, the one thing is that community, right? If I was trying to study the stuff on my own, I, you know, not understand it or, you know, be really stuck. Maybe I'd go off in the wrong direction. Um, yeah, just the community, especially that study group that I'm with, you know, I'm lucky to be with that. Um, that's really, uh, speeding up the, the learning curve for me. So just really totally grateful for that. Um, the second thing actually is, um, because I don't have a background in this and I'm, I'm learning the right way to do things right off the bat. So I don't have any bad habits to break. Right. <laughs> um, what, <laughs> what this has allowed me to do is, because I'm starting to see some chatter in the quality field on industry 4.0. And what this has allowed me to do is see through the BS as people write little books or big books or write articles and all that, you know, I can, as opposed to learning the crap that's out there, you know, I can go, ah, they're wrong. You know, that, that's wrong. You know, or there's <laughs> and some now key- you're able to identify the gaps in what exactly. they're saying. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Somebody right. wrote a PhD wrote like a 500 page book, the, you know, definitive guide to this and that. And, um, <laughs> You know, they had 25 years worth of experience in this. And I'm thinking, I don't know if it's been around that long, but I'll check on that. (laughs) And uh, there was just a handful of pages dedicated to the, you know, ISA 95 standard, just kind of almost like a side note. Which, by the way, is the backbone of digital transformation. Well, the standard is. ISA 95 is important because it is the gold standard. But if you don't have a standard for organizing industrial data, I mean, it's literally the, the backbone. And you never see it referenced it, or hardly ever see it referenced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The ISA 95? Correct. Or or a, a comparable standard for how you, I mean, again, if you're, if you, what we're going to do is connect everyone together. Right. Well, next week I want to talk about ISA. You have to know 88. how to organize it. S88? ISA 88, which is for similar batch, to batch site. It's uh, enterprise, site, line, cell. But then it goes down deeper on the cell. Like, what is the cell? There's the machine. And then, you know, um, but next week we're actually, I wanted to give a shout out to next week. We're having Mario on the community spotlight, um, which is going to be exciting. And he's from PAC IOT, member of our mastermind program. Um, and GoPal says ISA S95. So, yeah. Uh, hey, John, uh, any parting thoughts that be, before we move on to the rest of the stuff? Uh, no, I just appreciate you guys. This is, this is so helpful for me. And, and you know, I'm sp- stoked to be you know, a part of this community and uh, look forward to great things. I appreciate you, brother. Thank you. Oh, for, and you know, uh, for, for anyone in step one, uh, we're meeting tomorrow to go over the practical test that has, if you've gone through step one and you've gone through IU, you've gone through all of your disciplinary front end training, back end training, we're ready to release the step one practical and we're going to go over it in a 30 minute Zoom tomorrow. So, and, or if you have any questions for John, John you're Sindrich, one of those guys, right? You're ready to do the practical. Yeah. yeah. So we're doing a, we're doing a session. Hey, uh, Vaughn, what time is that tomorrow? It's at the end of the day, right? Four o'clock or something. It's 4.30 CST. Yes. So at 4.30 central time tomorrow, we have a 30 minute call where we're going to take the first group of folks through the practical, just explain the practical through the deck, turn it over to you guys. And then you guys can go ahead and do it. So um john sindrich uh, appreciate you man and Thanks, uh appreciate uh 
appreciate everything you do in the community and thanks for coming on. Thank you, Walker. Appreciate it. My pleasure, brother. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to go and answer some questions now. Um, yeah, we got some really good questions this week. All right. So welcome back. Hey, quick updates. Discord, we are 971 members. That's awesome. Uh, Digital Factory Mastermind program. So uh, for the Digital Mastermind members, um, Friday, we have our, our monthly session. It's going to be, Zvon has scheduled it. He has set aside three hours, but it's designed to be a two hour session. So, um, it, and it's at eight o'clock central. We're going to be going over, this is probably the number one question that we keep getting, um, is we're going to go over historian nodes and the unified namespace. So what is the role of the historian? How do you connect into the unified namespace? How does it consume the events from the structure, store the time series data? And how does it put it back into the unified namespace? And we're going to do that by using Canary Labs as our example um, historian. So um, the other thing is there's a there's a training session for Canary Labs th taking place in Arlington. I'm going to announce it next week. <clears throat> uh, mm -hmm. Jeff Nepper from Canary Labs reached out, uh, texted me last week sometime ab about this session. I think it's in April, might be in March, but I'll have an announcement for it. But we're going to be using Canary Labs historian this Friday, I'm going to show you, okay, how do you use a historian? Dave Schultz is already doing this, one of the members, um, but we're going to show you how, how, to, how to make that happen. All right, questions. So this week I've got, we're going to do a little different this week. I'm only going to answer three questions and then anything that you guys put in the YouTube chat, into the stream chat, um, Zach will just let me know if I need to answer it. And then I'm actually going to do like a quick training thing. I'm going to talk about prevailing thought, the digital thread, and I'm going to kind of drive home the UNS thing. So I'm going to answer some questions, but I wanted to touch on something that's come up quite a bit in the last few weeks in meetings that we've been having with clients. And I kind of want to, I want to let you guys know that this is something you're going to keep running into. And I want to give you guys the answer, you know, uh, in this session. So number one, question number one, this is from uh, Sherry I.M., um, so this is in the general chat in Discord. Um, so I'm going to go over there. Um, all right, general Discord. Uh, where did Sherry post this? Right oh, here. and if you guys are wondering, the little oh. Me6 bot, the levels, is just a little hack for, you know, if you guys are engaging in Discord, you'll get ranked up from the Me6 bot. That was one of the questions you guys had. Um, so Sherry said, what's wrong with this ad from OSI Soft? So they dropped this yesterday to promote their high server in the cloud. Um, somehow it feels both clueless and insulting to me, but I'm wondering how others react to it is don't look bad in front of the rest of the company, the best argument they can make. So, all right. So I, I'm not going to, we're not going to play the video. The reason why is um, we, um, we, you know, we'll, we'll this is we'll not a reaction. It so video. you can watch it after. Right. So here's basically what happens. Okay. In the video, it's a two minute video and it's basically, Hey, some request comes in, you're getting ready to go to lunch. A request comes in for some data that somebody needs. Um, and, um, you know, you don't want to sound clueless. You don't want it to take forever. You can basically use this, this pass solution, which is basically you can deploy a Pi client service into the cloud to allow them to access their the data they need. Okay, so you can select what data, uh, what time series data that person needs, um, what range you want to give it to them, and then you basically create like an endpoint that they can they can use to get their data. Okay. Her question is, you know, what you know, what do you think of this video? So here's my personal take on this video. It's absolute shit. It's trash. It's tap It's typical Aviva marketing. Okay. Um, this is not OSI. Nobody at OSI would be dumb enough to make this video. This is absolutely an Aviva video. Okay. Um, here's the point. The point is, is that their, their appeal to now what, who they're appealing to is whoever owns industrial data at your organization. So if you are the owner of industrial data, industrial data there, this is a call to you. All right. And so this would be like a member of the data enablement team. This would be a member of the big data team or the industrial data team. They're making this call to you. And the call in, 
And the appeal that they're making to you is you don't care about uh, giving people the data they need. What you care about is eating a burrito at lunch. You care about doing the bare minimum and you're not interested in enabling other members of, of your organization to access the data they need. Okay, so number one, from a purely emotional standpoint, it is insulting. It's an absolutely insulting. If I'm an engaged, if I'm a guy who is running into the fire when everyone else is running away, I want to solve problems. I'm going to be insulted by the suggestion that my primary goal is to get this over with as quickly as possible. Okay, number one. Okay, I'm, I would be, ins I'm insulted by the, in the intimation that all I care about is getting to my burrito, okay? Now, even if it's tongue in cheek, it's still insulting, okay? It's, it's totally tone deaf. Now let's talk about the OSI service. So from, so let's talk about it on a technical perspective. Here's the problem with the advertisement on a, or from this video from a purely technical perspective. It operates under the assumption that data enablement should be a thing. <laughs> yeah, and when it you said it, an owner it of industrial data, what does that even mean? It operates under the assumption that you have people in your organization who should police who, hack, who accesses data and who doesn't. And people shouldn't do that. Technology should. It should be democratized. Okay? That's right, you democratize your data you pick the, the correct technology, you use the right architecture, and the policing is taken care of for you. The I, here's the idea. The idea, what you did, the whole idea of digital transformation is that I, may, I get hired as a manufacturing engineer. And the organization is hiring me because hopefully during the interview process, I demonstrated that I have abilities outside of just what I was educated for in school. That is, I'm an innovator. I'm somebody who's going to be able to identify problems that other people can't identify, right? So digital transformation is all about enabling me to test my ideas. It's all about enabling guys like John Sindrich to test his without having to go through or jump over or try to circumvent um, barriers that are put in my way, okay? That's what digital transformation is all about. This, v, this video right here, it, and I'm going to, I have, this is the first time I've seen it. I'm actually going to call my guy at Aviva and tell him what the F is going on with you guys. Why would you put, why would you publish? This is, this is the same thing. Like when I look at this and I think, how absolutely off the mark could you possibly be? You're off the mark in the tone. You're also off the mark in the technology. You're making assumptions. You're perpetuating the reason why digital transformation fails. You're perpetuating the ideas in this video. And so when a guy like me looks at this video, somebody who has a track record of digitally transforming an organization, who, has the, who goes in and architects these solutions, when I watch that video, I go, there's no fucking way I'm going anywhere near OSI Soft's products. That is what's happening in my head. And I'm not the only person who's doing that, by the way. The people you need to suggest your products in these solutions are saying, get out of here. Okay, so Sherry, I, Sherry, I am, you are spot on. This is an insulting ad. It's tone deaf, and it misses the point completely from a both technological standpoint and from a philosophical standpoint. There's my answer. <laughs> yeah, that's Cheryl, Cheryl M. Oh, Cheryl. Oh, this is uh, Cheryl, Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl said, yep, that's exactly what I thought. Thanks for okay. sharing that, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, all right, Spado. Um, so Spado asked the question about um, a CNC machine and collecting data. And I saw that everybody answered about MT Connect and stuff. I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance um, to respond there. Uh, by the way, I, I did a little thing so you guys can see, and then I'm going to show you that article. Um, there's Matthew's long comment. <laughs> yeah, get to that. We're going to respond to Matthew's comment. Uh, let me go here. So it's in here, right? His question was in here. In general, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. 
in Discord. Spado was in the general chat, actually. All right. So basically what, what Spado wants to know is, A, number one, how do I collect data from a CNC machine? Right. Number one. And then num how would I do it for this specific machine? But then number two, what, what information do I need to give to my machine builders so that when they ship the equipment, they ship it ready for me to be able to plug it into my ecosystem? Very good question. Okay. So everyone already touched it. And Dowdell, Michael Dowdell did a great job chiming in here. A bunch of people did actually. But so I want to talk a little bit about MT Connect. So within the CNC world, MT Connect is the most common mechanism for pulling data from CNC machines. So that's gonna be things like, um, you know, CNC lathes, all right? Um, here, here's why, MT Connect is a, it's a standard and protocol together, okay? That is, it is a standard for machining and the MT Connect protocol. What, the way that it's designed is that the way that data is organized in a CNC machine MT Connect, it gives you the maximum ability to untap it. That is the data modeling that's inside of a CNC machine, number one. Number two, there are all sorts of connectors, MT Connect connectors, they're adapters that you can purchase, install on a CNC machine, and then you can talk over MT Connect to like your OPC server. So like Kepware has an MT Connect driver on it. So if you have an MT Connect adapter, on a CNC machine, you can unlock all the data that's inside that equipment using MT Connect. Now, there are other ways to unlock from a CNC machine, but MT Connect is the most common. If you're using like say a FANUC controller on your CNC lathe, there are drivers that will talk directly to the FANUC controller, all right? Um, and, and other controllers for CNC lathes, okay? But the most common way, and if you want to really standardize data collection on a CNC lathe, the best way to do that is through MT Connect. The reason why is that um, you can, the, the, the MT Connect itself has a mechanism for consuming models and methods from the, the CNC controller, okay? But it's a, it's a standard way of talking to those machines, okay? What should you be telling your machine builders when they ship the machine builder uh, uh, mach ships the machine to you. If you decide to settle on MT Connect, now if you settle on MT Connect, it means that each of those machines have to come with a MT Connect adapter on them, right? And that's going to be that's going to be a um, that can either be that the controller itself supports MT Connect out of the box, or there's a, a um, an external adapter that gets plugged in and communicates to the controller and then converts it to MT Connect, you aggregate it, and then you convert it to like MQTT or something. The, what's most important to do though, if I, without getting into a big consulting call, is that here's the conversation you have with your machine builder. Number one, how do external consumers consume the data from that machine? Number one, if I'm an external consumer, I wanna pull out the registers that contain, you know, the way CNC works is, you know, you'll have registers that contain the individual commands for the next step, okay? So if I'm machining a part, there, there's actually individual commands. You'll have, a, you'll have a program command that tells you which line in the CNC program you are on at that moment, all right? So how would I, how would I unlock that information? The question you wanna ask the machine builder is, how do you support external consumers consuming information like which line in the program are we running right now, okay? Or if I wanna read the lifetime counter, or if I wanna read the resettable counter, or I wanna look at the status register, how do you support that? That's question number one. If they don't, if they don't have a mechanism to do that run, okay, don't use that machine builder. If they, if they tell you that they support it, but they have a proprietary, you know, we have a solution, a software solution you could purchase from us that allows you to do that run. If they tell you that they support, you know, a, uh, you know, we're using off-the-shelf FANA controllers, therefore you can use this driver to communicate and, and pull the data. Or, we, you know, we support MT Connect. We we can you for an upsell, you can purchase the MT Connect adapter and we'll ship it with the MT Connect adapter. So that's 
So in a nutshell, the high level 10,000 foot view, that's what, that's what your question should, the, the question you should have to your machine builder. Okay. Anybody comment in there, Zach? Yeah, about that? Matthew Paris said MQTT can, or no, M MT Connect does what OPC UA wants to do, except their transport is standard HTTP. So it has been adopted fairly fast. Very, very, uh, so this, I was going, I was actually going to use the OPC UA reference that MT Connect is to, to um, CNC as, as OPC was supposed to be for all industrial data. Um, MT Connect has a lot fewer gaps, number one, and it's much more specialized, right? It's specialized specifically to machining, right? It, it really, it, that's where its real strength is, but Paris spot on, you're, Smart so the first question you asked though is how do external consumers access the data on your machine? And then the second question is what's that? What would the second would there be a second question? Or question number like, one is how do the external consumers and number two, what do I got to do to, to do whatever that is? Right. So and it's not so number one, centric. how do I access how do external consumers access? Number two, what do I got to do to access it the way that you're supposed to? Do I gotta do I need a special adapter? Do I need a special piece of software? Do I got to buy some special piece of software from you? That kind of thing. What most machine builders are doing, by the way, like people who are building lathes and stuff, they're developing their own like MES layer on their machine as an add-on. They're building their own um, software analytics platform that they're, they're trying to sell to you as an add-on. You run from that stuff. That's a solution-centered approach to, you know, trying to solve really what is basic problems that should be solved within your IoT platform. Any other comments on that one? No, it was a good one. Good one. Thanks. Well, cool. was I too hard on um, a VV thing? No, no, you were good. All right, cool. Uh, Andrew Ott, one of my favorite guys. He's a member of Sindrich's um, study group on Saturdays. Um, so Andrew asked, uh, I've been going through the enterprise solutions course and Walker mentioned vanilla scrum in the industry 3.0 system integrator video. Are there any links or resources, uh, more information on Scrum? Okay. The answer is yes. So I, it actually took me a while to find this one. Um, I'd read this a long time ago, but what we'll do is include, Zach will include this link um, yeah, on the video. We'll update it. But there's a really good um, article on scrum.org that talks about A, what is Scrum used for? And, you know, it gets into the technical details, number one. It also talks about how most people start with vanilla Scrum and they start moving forward. They evolve in terms of how they how, um, how they leverage agile project management methodologies. Gets a lot into details into what technical debt is for you guys. Uh, for those of you that are not um, or your software developers, technical debt is basically anything that you would have to refactor. So it's any gap, right? And anything that you would have to refactor. That's so. If I once I get a new idea, the idea of Scrum is is so that I don't have to redo anything. As a new request comes in, I don't have to refactor in order to provide that new feature, right? But um, Andrew, what we'll do is we'll provide the link to this article on scrum.org. It's uh, the name of the article is Scrum and Technical Excellence. It's from a couple of years ago, but this is the one, I actually saved it into my pocket uh, and I share it as a PDF to people when they ask, but so it took me a while to find it. But this is, this is the best, um, you know, beginner article that starts out beginner and ends up intermediate. This is my recommendation for what you, you, you will walk away from um, this article understanding much better how you're going to apply Scrum and how that turns into being agile. Okay. Awesome. JRS89 said most MT Connect adapters are pretty incomplete in terms of the data available. One of the, one of the ways that it's similar with OPC UA. So one yeah, of my complaints with OPC UA is that OP, so much in OPC is optional. It's the same thing in MT Connect. There, so much in the standard is optional. Um, what, he, what he's specifically talking about is the various connectors that people write to talk to their controllers. What they may do is they may write a, an MT Connect adapter that own, and then and what they're doing is they're physically or they're manually mapping that adapter to the data model inside the CNC, and they right. may not map it to everything. That's what he means there. Well, eventually, I, th I would just tell my machine builder that there needs to be a, a local namespace. There needs to be a UNS on the edge 
that all of the data pertinent to that device is already built into that UNS. So you have a few drives, let's say you have a PLC, you have an HMI, maybe you have some other devices. Why not as a machine builder, aggregate all that data to one namespace, maybe on an Advantech here, Uno? Or, here, here's what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. And then you publish the whole thing in. What's going to happen is a hardware, very similar to HiBite. Look at what happened with HiBite, right? Tony Payne, who used to be the, the big cheese at Kepware, and he really built Kepware, right? Tony Payne and John Harrington and um, Tori and Aaron Semley, all these former Kepware people, they all saw the writing on the wall. They saw, oh, wait, there is a huge opportunity here on the software side, right? On the software side to create a product that can do all of your, your you know, all your connectivity, all your modeling and, and serve as your unified namespace. And so Tony saw that opportunity and, and those guys all broke off and created high bite and built the intelligence up. The exact same thing is going to happen in the CNC controller world. The exact same thing is already happening in the sensor world. This exact same thing has already happened in the PLC world. It's already happened at the SCADA layer and the MES layer. It's, it's everywhere around us. To John Sindrich's original point, which was one of the biggest things he's gotten out of, um, you know, the number two behind the community is he now can spot the bullshit, right? He, he now understands what is marketing and what is brass tax. And as more and more people in the community understand, oh, wait a minute. We get you know, stronger. Right. Aviva's selling me a, a, a load of bullshit, right? Um, Rockwell's selling me a load of crap. You know, they're, you know, <laughs> The more that they understand that, the more that they are going to focus on, like you're going to, when you start specking solutions, you're going to start steering your hardware towards Opto 22 and bedrock automation and the Siemens hardware that supports the technology you actually need to digitally transform, right? You're going to start steering yourself there. And that is going to drive the market to further support the technology that you need in order to successfully digitally transform. The same thing is going to happen in the CNC world, the exact same thing. And, and what it takes are consumers who are going to demand those changes, right? Amen. Any other questions pop up before I... Yeah, uh, say, say um, asked, what is your take on Apache Kafka as the unified namespace? It can't, so Kafka can't really serve as a namespace, a unified namespace. What Kafka is really meant for and where you see it in digital trans, like it's most, uh, you know, what role it really serves in an IoT infrastructure is data optimization, specifically streaming like time series data and optimizing that, that data prior to shipping it to a data lake for some other type of big data, anal you know, big data analysis, right? That is where Kafka really fits here. It has other ancillary features, right? Where, you know, you see it in the space, you know, they're, the Venn diagram, all the circles overlap. But where Ka what Kafka's role, when someone says to me, hey, wh where does Kafka fit in the industry 4.0 world? In my opinion, what it is best at, best in class at, is optimizing data for streaming to a data lake. That is what it's best at. It can't really act as a unified namespace, and here's why. It can't, Kafka cannot, cannot manage all of the structure and events in real time. And because it can't, it can't act as a unified namespace, even though at maybe first glance, oh, I, I can do the structure there and I can do events, but I can't do all events. Remember, the data that gets into Kafka and be in prior, you know, where Kafka is essentially going to optimize and, you know, stream to a data lake, generally that's what you're seeing here. It's like, um, you know, Kafka is sitting at like L2 and it's, it's aggregating and optimizing and then streaming up into the data lake, right? It doesn't, it, Kafka is missing the ability to take the context it creates and put it somewhere else for some other consumer to use. And it's missing the ability for ancillary consumers within its area to be able to consume from it because that's not what it was designed to do. But anyway, the, the Kafka question is pretty common. Probably the, the, the two top questions we get are, 
can OSI Pi act as a unified namespace and can Kafka act, act as a unified namespace? And the answer is not just flat out no. It is not really. Like that's what it means. That's the you the yes, but you didn't. You wouldn't want to. <laughs> right. Yes, you could do it, but you don't want to do that. Like it's it, for many reasons. You're building a your wall on top of a couch. All right. I want to take the last fifteen minutes, and if there's any other questions, I'll answer them right at the very end because I want to go through this. Okay. Uh, this is a lesson. You know, unplanned. I just did. I put it all together. Like right that you can see, I was capturing the icons right before this. The reason I'm putting this in this session is because this has come up quite a bit in the last month in conversations we've been having with several of our clients. Okay. So we're, right now we're working with a lot of really huge companies and, um, and as we're going through like digital transformation maturity assessments with them, you know, part of what we do during the maturity assessment is we're analyzing, we're evaluating um, five core sectors of the business. So there are five main groups we meet with. And then from there, we have breakout sessions with the subgroups. We look at all their different platforms, all that kind of stuff. Here's something that's been happening very often. Most of these big organizations have IoT groups, okay? They've got big data group. They've got a data group, data enablement. They got all that stuff. They've, and they've got IoT groups. Everyone is doing the exact same architecture that is going to fail, okay? We're getting involved at the very beginning you know, maybe they're a year in, maybe they're two years in. They've had a couple of small, isolated, solution-centered wins, but they can't scale. And that's the reason we're coming in. They're like, why is it, you know, our roadmap's got us digitally transforming in 12 years. You know, we can't wait 12 years. So what's the problem here? Here's the problem, if you guys want to know, and, and so that you can identify it. On the left-hand side here is what most organizations are doing on some level. Okay, they're using what is known as a solution centered approach, which you guys have heard. Another term that you might hear is the digital thread. All right, what is the digital thread? It's very simple. For operational data, OT, digital thread is basically an object that originates on the edge. That object could be something like a valve. It doesn't even have to be an object, it could just be a, a single data point, right? You have a digital thread for that data point. But Basically, something originates on the edge, and what they do is they try to get it as fast as they can into a data lake, okay? So they get many digital threads that originate on the edge. I've got all these various sensors. These sensors all talk to different PLCs, and what I'm doing is I'm creating a digital thread that is threading that event from the PLC into a data lake as quickly as I possibly can. This data lake is their what they hope to be their uh, single source of truth, okay? And I may have it streaming directly into the data lake, that data thread, that, that digital thread from this sensor all the way into the data lake, or I may, maybe I've got a, an OPC server that is collecting data from a couple of PLCs, and then I've got the OPC server or like a data collector PLC, you know, streaming those digital threads into the data lake. Then what they do is they put a layer on top of the data lake. So when they call, they talk about IoT, okay? What they'll do is they'll put another layer right on top of the data lake that extracts the data, okay? So they've got teams that, they have teams that decide, you know, who gets access to what data and that kind of stuff. And then what they do is they'll put a, a layer on top of it where we do analysis, post-processing. We'll pull that data from the sensors. We'll do some post-processing. And then on top of that, they will have a visualization layer, you know, Power BI, ThingWorks, you name it, whatever. And then the human being, the human being is unlocking the data um, from that, that visualization layer, okay? That, so that's the person. All right, here, here's the problem with this. This is, if you're an organization and you see this, this is this looks very similar to what you're doing. Listen, it's not going to work, guys. Okay, it's it's not. You're here's why it's not going to work. You're not normalizing your data. You're not abstracting your data until you get to that analysis engine. You have no standard for the data. You have gaps in the data. Why? Because there's data and information that's created at every other layer in the stack that you can't account for. There are literally gaps everywhere. Okay, 
You have capability gaps. That is, there are features you cannot build in this visualization layer. There are things you need that you can't build using Power BI or ThingWorks or some other IoT visualization layer. This is expensive to do, okay? There's a lot of people involved. It's expensive to do. So therefore, there are a lot of, there's a lot of potential value you never capture or realize because the ROI isn't there. The problem is, is that the, the cost is not absolute. It doesn't have to be that expensive. So you, you have high value targets, you know, you have mid value targets, you have low value targets. This approach here only is gonna allow, it's gonna provide some value, but it's only gonna provide value to the high value targets, okay? You're creating new data silos by doing this. You don't make the, John Sindrich alone mentioned that it, the, the data goes somewhere, but either it doesn't go there or he's not allowed to get it, okay? You're creating a new silo, right? And the biggest thing is, the biggest problem with this uh, architecture, the digital thread, is that you do, it doesn't unlock innovation on the plant floor. And what do I mean by that? We don't make it easy for people to get access to the data information that they need, when they need it, where they need it, and in the form they need it. And those requirements may change based on an idea they came up with, all right? On the fly, I've come up with an idea to innovate, I need to test. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna innovate and test that idea because the value isn't high enough. But for you MES guys out here, is Mario on the call right now? Vaughn or Vaughn and Zach? Mario's on, right? I can't see Zach has a uh, vision. All right, M MES, so MES. Uh, Sorry, I, oh, I stepped away. Well, the, uh, the MES folks, right? Um, there's two types of downtime. Right to, you know, you have long downtime, cataclysmic failures where a machine is down for hours and hours and hours. And then you have micro stops, okay? Micro stops are the machine may stop for five seconds and restart. It may stop for 15 seconds and restart, okay? You have a lot more micro stops than you do cataclysmic failures. And if you add up all of the micro stops, they will far out, outweigh the total number of major downtime events you've ever had. If you add up all the major downtime events in minutes and then add up all the micro stops, the micro stops far outweigh the, the major downtime events. But on face value, a micro stop in MES is not a high value target. When I look at just the, the five seconds I lost or the 15 seconds I lost, I, that doesn't look like high value to me. But I could create it, I could innovate if I have the ability. I could innovate an idea to eliminate that 15 seconds of downtime times a thousand if only given the opportunity. That's called unlocking potential on the plant floor. One of the problems with this digital threat approach is that it is absolute, okay? It is absolute and, and it, it, it does not unlock innovation on the plant floor. It only lets you go after big, you know, high dollar, high dollar items. This is what we do. So what we're talking about is the technology driven approach. This is what we teach to everyone. Everyone is learning this. So instead of taking a digital thread from the edge and discreetly mapping it into a data lake and making assumptions about how the data will be consumed and then not unlocking that data, you know, instead of taking this approach, what we do is we treat every layer of the business as a node in an ecosystem. And we use a unified namespace in order to make sure that we have no gaps, right? So we use a unified namespace where the PLC publishes into a specific location in the namespace, HMI, et cetera. All right. Um, did we you lose my camera, Zach? Um, yeah, you did. Hold on. Let me. Uh, oh, yeah. We, yeah, you're frozen there. Mario did say Mario did say yes. Now he is. What was the question? Um, is he in digital mastermind? No, I was talking specifically about MES, right? that in, in MES systems, what most customers wanna go after is the really big long downtime events. They wanna know what the long ones were. A bearing went bad, the machine was down for six hours. But your real problem is not those big, huge cataclysmic events. They're the little tiny ones, the little tiny microstars. The ones that management can't see. 
That's right. 12 seconds here, 25 seconds there. What you, Mario, who's an MES guy like me, he knows that the real value, if you want to capture real value, you really want to capture additional value by leveraging MES, you capture it not by analyzing the big, huge cataclysmic event, but by having visibility to little tiny ones that add up over time. That's where the value comes from that they're not even aware of. That was my point. I was looking for backing from other MES folks that yes, it isn't always the high value item. Yet the, the digital thread, this digital thread architecture only targets high value stuff. Why? Because it's too expensive to do anything else. Mm. So the approach that we take, the approach we take with the unified it's like namespace, an inside out approach. That's right. We treat everything as a node in the ecosystem, edge driven, report by exception, lightweight, open architecture. So what does techno what does technology driven give us? If solution centered gives us no normalization, no abstraction, no standard, data gaps, capability gaps, only high value targo targets, new data silos, and it doesn't allow you to unlock innovation on the plant floor, technology driven gives you normalized data that's abstracted, standardized with no gaps or nearly no gaps. The gaps you're going to have are only in the data where they don't where the technology doesn't meet your minimum technical requirements, right? No capability gaps. It's going to include mid and low level value targets, right? What is a target? It's a potential project, a potential solution you could develop in the ecosystem. No new data silo. In fact, you're unifying all the data into one big massive silo and you have standardized and custom innovation is unlocked on the plant floor. So standardized means the same stuff that you, this is standardized, the stuff you would build using a digital thread that is standardized solutions. The stuff that you would build on the plant floor to test a John Sindrich idea, that is a custom solution. He, gets, he, he has access to the data. He has access to the namespace. He can develop a solution and test it. And then if the business decides that that is going to provide enough value, you can scale it up the business and apply it in other places. That is what we do here, right? Everything that we're teaching is centered around, you know, I mean, doing this part, everything that we're teaching is centered around scalability. It's, it's all centered around solving problems. It's all centered around helping manufacturers do more with less. Not just doing more with less for high value targets, but doing more for, more for less in general, across the board and unlocking- From the potential, ground up. Right, unlocking potential all across the plant floor. When We're democratizing when innovation. That's right. So when you see this, if you're Michael Dowdell or you're Mario or you're any of the other guys in the, in the, in the gang, and you see this architecture, which you're going to see, believe me, I mean, in the last year, I have, I've, I've personally consulted for like two dozen major global 100 fortune 500 companies, huge manufacturers. Every single one of them either has no plan or they have this plan. None of them have this plan. And the reason that they brought us in is because they got a couple of wins doing it this way and then realized they had capability gaps, data gaps, no standards. They created new, high, new silos. And it's too expensive to do this for all the basic stuff that you want to do on the plant floor. Like something simple like, I want to be able to compare downtime across four different machines in, in four different areas that are all from the same manufacturer. I can't even get access to that. I can't put it together. All right, off my soapbox. Any, any remaining comments, questions, concerns on that piece? Mm, that was good. That was really good. Any, any other Do you guys, do you have any questions? Yeah. Uh, no, no questions in the chat. It did seem like that, that was a part that held people's attention. Uh, JRS said, pro tip, before you buy the machine, demand that the machine builder provide documentation of what every memory object tag. Most builders conceal this information. Yep. On purpose. They Stop most making... of them conceal it on purpose. Yep. Right. Because they want to sell you a same... solution-centric approach, right? Just, just like when you're integrate, you know, always demand, you know, what should you ask of your integrator? Show me your margins, number one. I want to know what your profit margin is on this. Number two, um, you got to include PLC code. Number three, you got to include your comments. Here, here's a little insider, insider baseball. Most systems integrators don't 
send you the PLC program that has the comments in it. Um, they keep that for themselves. Why? So you got to call them so they'll fix it. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's a uh, very common. It's the same ask, thing. These are hard questions to ask, but these are questions you need to ask. Oh, and, go and ahead and ask these questions. They're going to hate you. Right. I've been that guy. I have been the, I've well, been the engineer. One thing you can them. also do, which many of you, some of you have already been doing is, you know, let's say you work for a man, manufacturer and end user, come to the industry 4.0 discord and ask, Hey, I'm looking for an integrator. Hey, I'm looking for a PLC developer that shares our values. And you know, that's, that's where, that's why we created the, the army. Correct. And at Galleris in uh, industrial systems, GIS, John McKeon, he's a member of the community. His guys, one of his, one of his engineers has sat on, um, you know, we're doing a, a digital transformation maturity assessment. And one of his guys has sat through this whole session with us. Right. And, um, and then the other day, somebody reached out, Hey, we're looking for an integrator in the UK or whatever. And we're like, Hey, GIS is perfect. We already know these guys think exactly the same way we do. They're going through the same training our guys go through. We're like, yeah, this, this is the guy, this is the guy you want to be dealing with. John McKeon is the guy you want to talk to. And right. so we do it all the time. The community does it the whole time, all the time. You know, you can yeah. see it. I, it's, it's really crazy. I, I get like overwhelmed with emotion when I get a chance to finally go back, you know, when I get to do a deep dive in the discord server and I see the interaction that's going on and how people are helping one another and referring one another. One of the biggest things, by the way, that someone told me the other day in a private message, actually, this is like two weeks ago. He thanked me for the rules that we put in that doesn't allow us uh, explicit selling, right? So you're allowed to sell in the Discord server if someone solicits your product, right? Hey, can you tell me more about your product, but there's no active selling allowed in the discord server. Yes. Someone had asked me, they PM to me, Hey, is it okay? If I know you said it's no selling, is it okay if I ask for an integrator? And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's Absolutely. the place for it's it. It's just, is. you know, we don't want people, you if know, if you get inundated with spam, point. send me a PM. Cause we want to kick that person. We want it to be like, you know, open, you know, when we always say this, we're not actively selling when someone's ready to take that next step, they're going right. to, you know, say, Hey, I'm looking for a 4.0 solution integrator. I'm looking for, you can, you can do, you can do week, you can do business development in the server, but you can't actively sell in the server. There's a huge difference. It's one thing for somebody to say, I'm looking for what you've got. Hey guys, I'm looking for X, Y, and Z. And you go, Oh, I've got it here. Let me, I'll send you a PM. It's another thing entirely to like post in the discord server. Oh, Hey guys, come check out my thingy and this and that. No one wants to do that shit. They want to solve problems. You know what I mean? So when someone says, hey, I'm looking for X, Y, or Z, and you go, yes, we sell that, you are solving their problem. Yeah. But when you actively sell for someone who's not asking for your wares, you are annoying people. <laughs> and that's one of the things that people have said is like, hey, listen, you know, I, I love being in the community because I don't have to worry about getting bombarded by sales guys. I time. will say that my mom said that she heard through the grapevine, she, she works at another integrator, that people are talking, the community is talking about this industry 4.0 server, this Discord server. So definitely join if you guys have not already. Awesome. All right, see I'm, you guys I'm next done, week. man. Peace. Thank you, guys. Uh, hey, yeah, see you guys. Vaughn and Zach, we'll, uh, we'll chat offline, right? Thank you.